In this lecture, we're going to show that the iteration method that we've been talking about, the fixed point iteration method, does do what we need it to do. We're going to prove the correctness of the algorithm, which means we're going to show that the sequence that you get by iterating a function that has a fixed point on an interval under the right circumstances will converge to that fixed point. So this is our uh, convergence theorem, and there's a lot going on here. So let, let's see if we can't work through this and, and unpack all the detail. So first, we've got this function, and we're going to require that it has to be continuous, pretty standard requirement. And we're going to require this part here. This is the box criterion that we've talked about before. Right? So saying that our function has to stay inside a box on this interval. We're also going to require that the derivative exists. And now this is, we're coming up on the new part here. There has to exist a constant less than 1 such that the derivative is less than or equal to that constant on that open interval. Right, so it's, it's not enough for it to strictly be less than 1 anymore. We have to, to actually have a specific upper bound that is it's possible it may be equal to. That would be okay. Right, if all of these criteria are met, then for any starting point on that interval, the sequence we get by iterating over and over again into that function f has to converge to a fixed point. Okay, so let's see if we can prove this. Okay, first notice that the, because of the because of the box criteria that, that's met up there, we've already seen that that's enough to be certain that a fixed point does exist on this interval. And this, this is a little bit of a, of a technicality, but because of that box requirement, we know that this sequence is going to be defined for every, uh, for every possible value that we stick into it, right? The, the, every value we put in there gives us a number between a and b, and we know that the function is defined on the interval from a to b. So we don't have to worry about it, about our, our sequence magically disappearing at some point because the function becomes undefined. Okay, those are the technicalities. Now, now let, let's, let's show the convergence here. So what we're going to do, we're going to start by looking at the absolute value of p sub n minus p, right? The distance between the nth term in the sequence and the fixed point. To show convergence, I need to show that this is going to zero, right? And here's how I'm going to do this. Remember how we how we calculated how we calculate p sub n? Well, we get that by putting p sub n minus one into the function, and p that's the fixed point, so that has to be equal to f of p. Now I'm going to bring the mean value theorem into this. Remember, the mean value theorem says that if I have two points, say p sub n minus 1 and p, then there has to be a number on that interval somewhere such that the derivative at that number is equal to the slope of the secant line. All right, so let's call this z sub n. All right, so the mean value theorem is telling me that there has to be that z sub n so that f prime of z sub n times p n minus 1 minus p is equal to the difference of those two function values. All right, but now remember my restriction on the derivative. The derivative has to be less than or equal to that constant k, which means this is less than or equal to k times the absolute value of p n minus 1 minus p. Good. Now I'm going to write this over again. I'm just going to cut out all the stuff in the middle. P n minus P is less than or equal to K absolute value P n minus 1 minus P. Now repeat this iteratively. All right. So if, if you replace the n minus 1s, if you replace n with n minus 1, then we get that P n minus 1 minus P is less than or equal to K times the absolute value of p and minus 2 minus p. So in other words, this is less than or equal to k times k absolute value p and minus 2 minus p. This, of course, is 
k squared. Keep doing this over and over and over again. Eventually, we're going to get less than or equal to k to the n absolute value p0 minus p. p0 minus p, that's a constant. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take the limit. Take the limit as n goes to infinity, pn minus p, and this has to be less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of k to the n absolute value p0 minus p. Well, p0 minus p doesn't depend on n. The only thing that does here is that k to the n, and because k is strictly less than 1, as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0. So this is equal to 0 times that absolute value, which is just 0. And that's what I needed to show. The limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value p sub n minus p is equal to 0. And that tells me that the sequence p sub n converges to the fixed point p. So now that we know that this iterative sequence is going where we'd like it to go, our next step is to think about an error bound. And I have two ways of, of writing this here. Uh, the, the first one, uh, the first, sorry, first, just, just to start, all of the requirements here are just the same requirements that we had it in the previous proof. We've got the box criterion, uh, and we have uh, this restriction on the derivative. So this first one is, is actually pretty straightforward to get to. We, we saw uh, in, in the previous proof that the absolute value of p sub n minus p is less than or equal to k to the n times the absolute value of p0 minus p. All right, so where, where does that max expression come from? Well, if we've got a and b, then both p0 and p are in this interval somewhere. Now, p may be on the left side and may be on the right side. Here's how I'm going to get that max property. I know that p0 is closer to one of the two endpoints than p0 is. So, so that means that either the absolute value of p minus p0 is less than or equal to the absolute value of p0 minus a. You know, we don't need the absolute value there. It's just p0 minus a, because A is the left-hand endpoint, or this is less than or equal to B minus P0. Well, if it's less than both of them, then it's, it's less than the greater of the two, and that's where this maximum expression comes from. Now, to do this second one, uh, that proof actually takes a little space. There's several inequalities we're going to have to work through. All right, so how can we show this? Well, it's not necessarily complicated, but it, it is messy. It's going to be, I think, the biggest proof that we've done so far in the course here. So to see this, I want you to start by looking at the absolute value pn plus 1 minus p sub n. That's the, the distance between two successive iterations. Well, this is equal to the absolute value f of p sub n minus f of p sub n minus 1, because right, that's how we get our points. Right? We, we get each term in the sequence by putting the previous term into the function. And now, if you follow the exactly the same argument that we, we did uh, in the previous proof when we, were, when we were proving convergence, this is less than or equal to k times the absolute value p sub n minus p sub n plus 1. We iterate all the way down just like we did before this is less than or equal to k to the n absolute value p1 minus p0 hold on to that all right so now, now take a look at this all right i want, want you to go back to looking at something a little different this is p m minus p sub n so now, now we're not talking about 
necessarily two sequential terms. We're just talking about two arbitrary terms pulled out of the sequence. And I'm going to put some requirements here. Let's assume that m is the bigger of the two and n is greater than or equal to 1. This equals the absolute value of pm minus pm minus 1 plus pm minus 1 minus pm minus 2 plus pm minus 2. I'm making this telescoping series, sequence, uh, series here. And I'm going to keep this going down to p uh, n plus 1 minus p sub n. Now apply the triangle inequality. This is less than or equal to the absolute value of p sub m minus p sub m minus 1 plus the absolute value p m minus 1 minus p m minus 2 plus so on down to the absolute value p n plus 1 minus p n. All right, now we're, now we're going to come back to this part. Now we're going to come back to this inequality. And what I want you to notice here is that the exponent of the n is always the, sec the index of the second term, the one that's being subtracted. So this is less than or equal to k m minus 1 absolute value p1 minus p0 plus k m minus 2 absolute value p1 minus p0 plus so on down to k n absolute value p1 minus p0. Now, factor out k to the n absolute value of p1 minus p0. I'm going to factor out this last term from everything in here. If I do this, this equals k n absolute value p1 minus p0 times k m minus 1 minus n plus k m minus 2 minus n plus all the way down to plus k plus 1. All right, now, so what, what do we have here? Well, look, look back at this. The absolute value of p minus pn. This is equal to the limit as m approaches infinity of the absolute value p sub m minus p sub n. Remember, the sequence p sub m has to converge to the fixed point. Right, that's why this has to converge to this. Now, from what we just showed here, this is less than or equal to k to the n, or sorry, limit, limit m approaches infinity, k to the n, absolute value p1 minus p0, times the sum k, I uh, can't use k, let's use i, i equals 0 to m minus 1 minus n of k to the i. So m is the variable here, right? m is the variable. There's no m in either of these terms, right? So I can pull those terms out and make this uh, k n absolute value p1 minus p0 as m goes to infinity the upper limit here goes to infinity so this is times the sum i equals 0 to infinity of k to the i remember k is strictly less than 1 right, that means that that is a geometric series whose first term is 1, right? Because when i equals 0, was k to the 0, that's 1. Well, the sum of a geometric series where uh, the, the multiplier is less than 1 and the first term is exactly 1 
is 1 over 1 minus k. So this is k to the n over 1 minus k times the absolute value of p1 minus p0. Remember where we started. We have this up here. Right, so this is the absolute value. Pn minus p, we can reverse those in there, is less than or equal to this expression. k to the n over 1 minus k, absolute value p1 minus p0. And that's, that's a more practical bound than the previous one, which is why we went to the trouble. To, to apply, the, to actually calculate the previous bound, we needed to know the value of p. We don't know the value of p. That's the thing we're trying to find. Right, so th this one is uh, is technically a, a little a little more practical because it only re requires p1 and p0. And well, we know what both of those are. We picked p1, uh, p0, and we get p1 just by putting p0 into the function. So there was a little bit of give and take in this discussion. On the one hand, it's nice to know that our iteration method under the right circumstances converges, but unfortunately. The error bound that we found isn't as useful as the one we derived for the bisection method. Finding the, the box interval for our function can be tricky in its own right. There will often be more than one interval that meets the requirements, and the value of k is going to depend on our choice for that interval. So in general, while finding a, a value for the bound may be possible, it can be quite tricky to find the lowest bound across all the possible intervals from A to B. So in the next lecture, we're going to take up the question of convergence again, but this time from a more general perspective. We're going to define a new approach called the order of convergence. Then we'll see how we can apply that definition to get an idea of how quickly we can expect iterative methods as a class to converge.